Okay, so at this point, we've shown how Alice can connect all her devices to her personal mesh, which is her digital, digital gestalt, and provide her with all the security she needs on the internet. Or have we? I mean, how do we securely attach devices to Alice's personal mesh? How do we authenticate that system? Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in this presentation, I'm going to be looking at how we connect devices to a personal mesh. And this is the first of three separate presentations where I'm going to be drilling down and looking at three different communication protocols based on mesh messaging. This one describing connection of devices to a profile. The next one, exchange of credentials between Alice and Bob, Carol, Doug, and whoever. And finally, the confirmation protocol, which is two-factor authentication done right, done in a modern way. So those are to come. And I'll just point out at this point that all the same information that's in these videos is also available in documentary, in document form. Um, the reason I'm making videos is because different people find learning stuff in different ways, you know, easier in different ways. And so I'm providing videos and documentation so that uh, I can provide it in whichever form each individual person wants. And of course, you don't have to watch them in order. You can go backwards and forwards, read the documents, and then watch the videos maybe to clarify a few points that you were you know, finding obscure. So let's go forward then. How do we connect a device to a personal account? Well, the first thing is, when we create the mesh profile, we create the administration device. And that administration device, so this administration device will have at least one account created, and that account is connected up to a cloud service. And that cloud service has a, gives Alice her account identifier. So Alice at example.com. Okay, so it's giving Alice her externally visible internet address. And the way that we use it to connect a device is as follows. So Alice buys her new laptop. She opens it up and she installed the mesh tools on it. And she then types in example.com, you know, Alice at example.com, and says, connect me to that account. And the mesh management tool will create a device profile if it's not already got one, and it will prepare a message to request a connection to example.com. And then when this connection request is received, if there is an account, alice at example.com, the service does a little bit of work on its own here on behalf of Alice for later on. And in particular, it sends back a response that gives the device a authentication fingerprint with which to authenticate this connection request. And it just looks like any other. Uh, mesh fingerprint, except that because it's a message authentication code, it will start with an A. So something like A, B, Q, 7, 6, B. Okay, so Alice has gone as far as she can on the laptop. So she gets out her admin device. Might be immediately next to it, or it might be later the same day or the same week or months time ahead uh, but she she connects uh, opens up her admin device and she pull synchronizes her admin device to her cloud service which will synchronize the spool of all the requests and notices that there is this outstanding request from the laptop she just bought so she gets that down and the first thing that Alice is going to do is to check that the fingerprint that was displayed on the laptop is the same one as she has 
here on her admin device in the and and that if those two are the same it means that the request is is the same one that was generated by the laptop and that it is a request to join Alice's personal mesh now how do we achieve that well we use message authentication codes to do that you see this verification code was formed by taking the fingerprint of the device profile and the fingerprint of Alice's personal mesh taking the two of them together and using them to create the verification code which will be unique for the profile and the device connecting and any change to either one of them would cause that fingerprint to change so we get bi-directional authentication just by checking for equality and if they match uh, Alice well she bought the laptop she wants it to connect so she accepts the request obviously she can also reject the connect request in which case you know nothing more is going to happen uh, if she accepts the request her administration device will create everything that is needed to create a profile and activations for this device in the context of her mesh accounts and mesh profile and so all that is done uh, using the meta cryptography that I described a, a few um, videos ago so we do all that work on the admin and we send all the key contributions up to the service encrypted end to end underneath the key the device encryption key this is the only time in which we use that device encryption key we use it now and at no other time really um, so the device receives this uh, then the device next time it turns on it performs a complete operation and it receives the completion information it's now connected to Alice's mesh and can pull down all the information it needs from each of the accounts to which it, of Alice's accounts to which it has been connected and boom it's got everything there and it's all copious sympathetic so this is how we connect up um, a device in you know, the simplest case in which case we have a laptop or a desktop or a mobile phone type device that has a display and a keyboard and a communications capability now that works for most cases but if we were doing this in an enterprise well Alice has her laptop already say and the administrator is remote and she she is just looking to allow uh, this new employee to join the corporate mesh so at this point we want to allow the connection of that device via some sort of out-of-band authentication code so this uses what's called the pin authentication code technique so the administration device generates a random number which is a pin code and this pin code is sent up to the service and goes into the administration spool for this particular account and this administration spool is then used to share that pin code between all the administration devices that might be con connected you know you might have more than one you know you might have five six or more so we've created a pin code for Alice and get, we send the pin code out of band uh, you know might be in a secure end-to-end -end telephone call might be via letter post uh, might be uh, she goes to the badge office and get, is given it and so the pin code is sent out of band and this time when Alice connects up her laptop she connects to alicexample.com again but this time she also provides the pin code and that is also stored in the connection request information 
and again we use Max to do it in a secure binding so we don't reveal the secret to uh, prove that we know it and then this time when Alice's administration device connects up and synchronizes the auth the request has already been pre-approved so Alice still needs to use a, an administration device to connect the profile for that device because the keys necessary to create that profile only exist on an administration device. They don't exist in the cloud anywhere. So we still need to have that device involved. However, the um, because we've pre-approved it, Alice doesn't need to uh, think she, she knows that this is the laptop that was pre-approved by that pin and she she can authentically accept it automatically without having to com compare the uh, fingerprints for equality so we can do fingerprint uh, we can do a pin code pre-authorization essentially the same protocol but with a little bit of additional glue and this particular approach is really useful if we are connecting a phone to the uh, personal mesh. Because the thing that a phone has is it has a camera built in. So this new device that we're connecting can pick up all the connection information via a QR code. And so now we can go take our new device, we can scan a QR code on the administration device that has embedded into it the pin code, the account name, all the information that we require to connect. And then that, that uh, device that has a camera affordance can connect you know, in one and done. And as, at least as far as the user is concerned, you know, they just see I've scanned the QR code and it's done. Of course, behind the scenes, it's done all the internet connections as before, but the user doesn't need to see any of that. That's just plumbing. Okay, so we can do the camera on the device that is connecting. But there are some devices that are much less powerful than laptops or phones. Uh, so my watch, uh, my coffee pot, my refrigerator. Um, the coffee pot and the refrigerator, they don't have a camera and they probably don't even have a display. And so for those cases, what we want to be able to do is to use a static QR code on the device that's printed on the case and use the administration device with a, ca a camera in the administration device to scan it. And this is a very flexible way of getting your coffee pot online, getting your refrigerator, your light switch. All you need to do is just scan each one of them and bang, you're done. And yes, you might need to want to also provide a bit more information when you scan them so that then the rest of your IOT infrastructure that's controlling them knows what this, you know, where this light switch is in the house, that type of information. But all we need to do to get the security context is to scan the QR code and then a little dialogue will come up which will allow us to enter whatever else we need to enter on the administration device. So the way that this works is that the device when it's shipped has to have all the information that is necessary to be able to connect. And this is where those encrypted authenticated resource locator QR codes I demonstrated that has a UDF and a domain name and a fingerprint all joined together in one. Those uh, locate, encrypted locators are the way that we pull the bootstrap off some, you know, any old web service and can pull a record that will tell that device all the rest of what it needs to perform, to complete a connection for Alice's device. 
And so when Alice's administration device scans that QR code, it pulls that document and that document will tell it, OK, this device is bound to this particular service, mesh service in the cloud. And in order to claim it, here's the information that you need to, perf to make that claim and to bind it to your personal mesh. And so that's the way we pull the, we have the identifier printed on the outside of the device. That's a, a bootstrap that pulls the record out of the cloud. And then that record that we pull can provide us with all the rest of the information we need to authenticate and connect to whatever service we need to connect to, to complete the connection. And that pull can be done via a QR code, or it could be done by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, in that um, the uh, QR code might say, oh, when I'm turned on, if I've just been completely, re if I've been hard reset and I'm waiting to connect, this is the Wi-Fi SSID I will be listening for a connection from. Connect to that Wi-Fi SSID and talk to me. Or it might be a Bluetooth bootstrap or whatever. But as far as I'm, I don't really mind what it is, so long as the user does not need to know or care. You know, the user should not need to reconfigure their iPhone just to connect a smoke detector. And what's more, having connected their smoke detector once, they should not ever need to climb a 10-foot ladder at 3 o'clock in the morning to turn it off because that device has suddenly decided that it has a fault that requires it to be immediately disabled. Yes, 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 Google, I'm looking at you. OK, so we can have the camera on the administration device or on the device that's connecting. And we've got a protocol for either way. We can also define additional mechanisms as people invent them. The only thing that really matters as far as the mesh is concerned is that the admin device and the device that's connected can both discover each other. So the connecting device has to be able to find out enough information to connect to whatever local network it's on and to find the administration device somewhere. And we have to have a strong mutually mutual authentication. So that there's a work factor involved there that means that somebody can't just come along with a fake doorbell and connect it to Alice's device, uh, mesh, and use that at her house. We've got to get past the days of every Internet of Things device in the house being on the same shared secret, which is the secret that accesses the Wi-Fi network. That's bogus. We've also got to get past the uh, stage of the user having to do all this work to configure. So that's device connection for the mesh. And as I hope I've shown, it's not just about getting the crypto configured easily. It's about doing the whole of the configuration problem easily, fluently, and with the least amount of user effort and input possible. All the user ESA needs to do is to give an account number, an account identifier, and a PIN, or scan a QR code. And we should never ask them to do anything more to buy a device from us, because this is it. The harder IoT device manufacturers make configuring and managing their devices, the fewer devices they will sell. So if we make it really easy, they will buy more of them. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Again, click like if you want to have an internet that is secure and easy to use. Subscribe to my channel and please stay for the next podcast where I'll be showing how Alice and Bob can exchange their credentials. Thank you very much for watching.